Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. First of all, I want to say thank you to Pastor Lapine. I, I can't imagine on a day like today uh, giving the pulpit over to uh, someone else. I, I know he would love to be preaching now. He preached in the first service, and we thank you for that. Uh, so often when we're on the road, I'm the preacher, and uh, it's just great to sit and listen to the Word of God uh, from, from somebody else. Um, but uh, at any rate... Uh, Ronnie got married in August, just to bring you up to speed on things, married a, a godly young lady from uh, the Waterloo area. Her daddy's uh, chairman of the deacons at uh, Waterloo, the church there in Walnut, Walnut, uh, oh, Walnut Ridge. Thank you. I had a brain freeze there for a moment. And uh, so uh, we, uh, it's been exciting to see Ronnie in a new role as a married young man. Aaron is our second born. He's an RN uh, working at Mercy West Des Moines in their emergency room and uh, recently uh, has switched over to a medical track and is training to be a medical doctor and we'll see what uh, the Lord does there. Elizabeth has recently been engaged. I'll show you a picture there in a second. And we still have Jacob, our tallest boy now in the family, and Stephanie. Uh, at home, Jacob's 6'3 and 17, and Stephanie's 15, because she's not here going on 30. Um, she's the, she's the, uh, the go, go child, all right. But uh, that was a couple months ago. Uh, Avery Snyder, his parents are ministering in Florida, uh, asking for our daughter's hand in marriage. And uh, it's a new world, you know, you, you hire a photographer, you know, to, to be at the engagement as well. Uh, so I would like you to take your Bibles with me and go to Romans 10. And I would like to ask you, how many of you have heard the story of Louis Zamperini? All right, several of you, several of you. Um, I will just say what a good uh, reader would say is, if you've seen the movie Unbroken, you need to read the book. Uh, reading the book gives you the heart of what was going on. Louis Zamperini, called the Tornado of Torrance, uh, grew up in a, in a kind of an inner city background, moved to California. His brother noticed that uh, when Louis stole something, wow, could he run? And he was trying to steer him away from a life of crime to um, a, a life that counted for something, so he kind of was steering him into athletics, and lo and behold, Louis Zamperini made it to the Olympic Games in 1936 in Berlin, and uh, the mile, he was to be the first human being to ever run a mile in four minutes, and of course, in 1936, they didn't have the mile at the uh, Olympics, but it was going to be in the next Olympics, but the 1500 that he ran that day, he ran the last lap in a faster time than anyone in history had ever run that race. So much so that it impressed a guy who was watching in the stands named Adolf Hitler, who wanted to shake the hand of the young man who ran the fastest lap in history in the 1500. So he shook the hand of Adolf Hitler in 1936, only to realize that war would break out in Europe, the 1940 games would be canceled, uh, thus canceling his dream of running in that uh, that 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 world record uh, pace in the in the mile. And of course, in 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked, and Louis Zamperini and uh, most of his colleagues at that time joined the military. Louis was placed on a aircraft in the Air Force in the, in the Pacific, and they ran bombing missions. And on one of those missions, they had a mechanical failure, which uh, crash-landed the plane. All of the people on board were lost except for three. 
and they spent the next 47 days on a life raft just like that one. One of those individuals did not survive. They caught rainwater. Uh, they captured uh, birds that were landing on the raft and uh, captured them, ate them raw. They cat caught fish. Uh, it was just a, a story of survival. No one had ever survived for 47 days on a life raft, only to be found 47 days later by the Japanese and to go into a POW camp. About 130,000 people were held uh, by Japan during those days, and a third of them did not survive that captivity. This particular guard, Matsuhiro Wanabe, a.k.a. the bird, is, is told throughout this book uh, of Louis Zamperini telling the story of this man who, who took it to him and tortured him and, and just ravished his, his body and really was going after his spirit uh, of just trying to break him, thus the story unbroken. And uh, this went on from 1943 to August of 1945 when, when uh, we, we won the war, Japan surrendered, and these POWs were, were liberated, and they were, they were in terrible condition. Uh, for the next four years, Louis Zamperini uh, spent time just, and, and I'll, I'll just say one of the things that, that he said that kept him alive during that time was his rage for the bird. And even, even right at the very end that he and his colleagues didn't believe they would live uh, his fellow POWs didn't believe they would live much longer, and they were plotting a, a, um, a basically a suicide mission to kill the bird. That was going to be their last act uh, on this planet. And then, of course, uh, events changed. But uh, for the next four years, that rage poured into his life in alcohol consumption and, and his life spiraling. And he thought marriage would help him, and he found... Uh, a lady, and he married her, and, and life just continued to spiral, and things were not going well at all. And one day, uh, his wife went to a Billy Graham crusade. She heard the gospel uh, of Christ. She was saved that night. She came home. She told Louis that she had found Christ, and he needed to come, and he needed to hear the gospel message. And and Louis said, there is no way I'm not going, you know, and, and all this and that. She finally convinced him to come. He went, and when the invitation was given, he, he left in a rage. He was uh, very convicted by his sin and everything, but he was so angry, so ter uh, filled with turmoil. He writes in the book, many times he woke up at night strangling the bird, only to be strangling his wife. He had flashbacks personified uh, and dreams often. Well, to be, make his wife probably be quiet, he went again. He told her, when that invitation's given, I'm out of there. And as he got up at the invitation time to walk out of the building, just enraged again at what he heard and, and everything, all of a sudden he, re he remembered the deals that he made with God on the life draft. He said, I hadn't thought of those things once since I, I got out of the POW camps and and he said, right then and there, I knew that I needed the Lord. And instead of walking out of the meeting in a rage, he walked down the aisle and he trusted Christ that night. He went home, he poured his alcohol down the drain, and uh, incredibly, he never had another flashback ever again. His heart was filled with forgiveness. The next year, that was 1949 that he was saved. The very next year, he flew to Japan because he wanted to meet those guards that had tortured him. The bird was on the loose. He, he was a war criminal, and they couldn't find him. But he wanted to meet with the bird especially and, and tell them that he had forgiven them and that, that Christ had made the difference in his life. And incredibly, Louis Zamperini went on to be at 97 years old. Um, folks, he was saved at 32 years old. He went on to live 65 more years, and he carried the torch in his 90s when the games were in Japan. And he was still trying to find the bird because he still wanted to tell the bird about the saving power of Christ and the forgiveness that he had had in his heart for him. Folks, 
that is an amazing story, but it, it is a story that happens every time a person comes to Christ. A life is changed. A destiny is changed. And in Louis Zamperini's story, he, he went on in 1950, the year after he was saved, to start a ministry to, to wayward boys like himself and, uh, and went on to, to develop that ministry. And all of that happened because Christ sought out and found Louis Zamperini. Amen. Romans chapter 10 tells us a story. And uh, you, you probably are familiar with the, 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 the theology of the New Testament. The book of Romans is the theology of the New Testament. We have three chapters, one, two, and three, uh, telling us about the condition of man, just like Louis Zamperini. You, you don't have to be like Louis Zamperini and full of rage and alcohol dominating your life. You can be a very good looking citizen on the outside and do all many right things but inside you still need the Lord and you still are lost and that's really the message of Romans 1 through 3 and then chapters 4 and 5 telling us about this this story of justification God taking out his record book of offenses against us and based on our trust in Christ alone he takes his eraser and erases the offenses in his record book against us, and he declares us to be righteous when we're not. That's justification. And then because of that salvation, justification taking place, then 6, 7, and 8, chapter 6, 7, and 8 of the book of Romans, telling us now all the changes that are going to happen in your life are because God is now living in your life, and he's making those changes we call sanctification. And as if, as if Paul would, would anticipate the question, well, what about the Jews? What about Israel? And he, we have chapters 9, 10, and 11 in the book of Romans that talk about that very thing. Chapter 9, basically, God is sovereign. He does whatever he pleases. Chapter 10, he is going to reach the Jews, the individual Jews, the same way he's going to reach the individual Gentiles and the question that comes out of chapter 10 is, how can we proclaim Christ to the lost of our culture? That is not a new question. It's an old question. It's the question that Paul raised in Romans chapter 10, 2,000 years ago. The first way that Paul brings to us, the first point that he makes in Romans chapter 10, the first way that you're going to proclaim Christ to the loss of our culture is you're going to have to have a deep compassion for the lost. I really appreciate that about your pastoral staff, your pastor's heart. If you were here in the first service, you heard your pastor's heart. Your pastor has a heart for the lost. And I would imagine that this church has a heart for the lost. That's good because our Savior has a heart for the lost. Romans chapter 10, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Let's look at that for a moment. Israel had religious zeal, but Paul says they had no knowledge of the gospel. They had religion, but they did not have the truth. And folks, if we have learned anything in the last five years, and that is that zeal without truth is dangerous. Religious zeal without the truth and life-changing claims of Christ is dangerous. And we've seen that in our world. But I would like to also say that truth without zeal is a contradiction. If we know the Word of God and we know what is the future of the redeemed and we know what the future of those who have not placed their trust in Christ alone to save is, and we choose to do nothing about that, that's a contradiction. 
In fact, that might be one of the things that comes up in a conversation with the lost of our culture. Well, why aren't all Christians doing what you're doing? I recently had a couple 18-year-old young ladies, Jehovah's Witnesses, show up at my door. And uh, I don't know what's going on in the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, but it's, uh, I've, I've kind of seen a new change in, the, in those that come to your door. But two, two young 18-year-olds, nobody sitting in the car, you know, training them or anything. Um, very sharp 18-year-old girls. But I want to step out and talk to these people because you know what? They're not the deceivers. They're the deceived. There's a big difference. And, and I want to I step out and give at the very least a testimony of what it means to place your trust in Jesus Christ to save you from your sin. I don't want to turn them away. And I, I, I would hope that when we see somebody who is lost, that we would go out of our way and say, wow, I need to have a compassion for people that God brings to me. And Paul said, Israel had this religious zeal without knowledge. They also had pride without repentance. Notice verse 3 when he says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. Vincent says that word establish means they would erect a righteousness of their own as a monument to their own glory and not to God's. It sounds a lot like the Garden of Eden, if you think about it. You know, the, the, the tempter comes to Eve and says, you know, you really can't trust God. In fact, what you can do and what you should do is fulfill your own self-satisfaction. The tree looked good. The fruit looked good to eat. There's a lot of self-gratification in Genesis chapter 3 as Eve fell to the temptation and reached and took the fruit and ate. And in that moment of evil, the greatest evil of all, rebellion to God, the God who very much wants to fellowship with you for all eternity, in that very moment, she believed the devil over God. That's really at the spirit of religion that says, you know what, I'll, I'll get there on my own. I, I don't need the word of God. I don't need to follow his way. And it's not a new thing. It's an old lie. If you were here in Sunday school and you heard our ministry, uh, we're on deputation to raise support to go to Missionary Acres. And I recently mentioned that I, I, I have a new EMT job. I've been an EMT for seven years and I just got a, a new job going in southern Iowa. Um, by the way, I saw five eight-point bucks on my way to the job this week. Uh, <clears throat> It's killing me, you know, I, I, after you got to wait 90 days before being a resident, you know, but anyways, that was Wednesday, so I'm, I could go out and get my license now, but at any rate, that was a aside. Uh, on one of my calls in Sox Center, we, it, this happened within the city limits, 30 mile an hour, I'm going to share with you just information that was in the local newspaper, so HIPAA's not being violated here, but uh, uh, we had a photographer on scene from the local newspaper, and, and uh, one of the pictures that he took made the paper, and I said to him, just for training purposes, I'd like to have that picture if you'd give it to us. And he said, sure, would you like the whole disc? I said, sure. And uh, he delivered about 50 pictures that he took on scene. This is our crew arriving, and uh, what we have is a pickup truck pulling a horse trailer with horses in it. Uh, you'll notice the pickup truck with a cattle guard on the front does not have a broken windshield, nor does it have airbag deployment, but the Oldsmobile Intrigue is totally destroyed. And in that passenger seat was an 18-year-old girl. And as a first responder, I had the, I had the opportunity. You hope to be able to get there and make a difference of life and death, 
And all I had that day was to take a carotid pulse of a pulseless 18-year-old. We tend to think that the people that are around us will be there the next day. We tend to live life that way. It's not the case. If you work in EMS, you know that's not the case. If you work in healthcare, you know that's not the case. There are people that are lost and dying of all ages, all around us. And Paul is saying to us, we need to have a compassion for the lost. We have the, the lifesaver with us. And they're drowning. What are we going to do about that? Paul then goes on to say, we not only need to have a deep compassion for the lost, we need to have a sufficient understanding of the gospel. Would you notice verse 4? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. By the way, that's a quotation of Leviticus 18, verse 5, which basically says that if a person could keep the law perfectly, could he go to heaven? Sure, if he could keep the law perfectly, but the point is he cannot keep the law perfectly. And so the man who does those things should live by them, but he doesn't. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. This is an interesting quote in a very famous passage of Scripture. This is a quotation from Deuteronomy 30, where if you remember, Moses brought the children of Israel to Kadesh Barnea. They sent out the 12 spies. Ten came back, said, no, we can't take the land. Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can. They voted the 10 won. The majority won. Majority's always right, right? Wrong. Majority was wrong in that case. And God said, because of that, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation who voted die off. And that took about 38 to 40 years. And then they all died off. And the new generation, their children, now were adults. And Moses brought them back to that same location, back to getting into the promised land in Deuteronomy 30. And he says, now look, God will bless you if you obey him, and God will curse you if you don't obey him. You've got your parents as an example here. And Deuteronomy 30 is Moses rehearsing for them in the second law that this is what's going to happen. Obey, and there's going to be blessing. And you know what, Israel? You've memorized the very words of God. They are not only in your mind, but they are on your lips. Do it. And when Paul quotes Deuteronomy 30, he actually interprets and, and applies that to the New, Test New Testament Christian. Notice it. The man who does those things shall live by them. Verse 6. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? In other words, Moses is telling the children of Israel, don't say in your heart, do we got to go to heaven to find God's will? No. And notice this is in parentheses, that is to bring Christ down from above. New Testament Christian, do you got to go to heaven and consult Christ about what you're to do with the Son of God, the gospel? No, because he came down. Who will, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? Do we need to get a spade and go to Israel today and start digging for Christ to find out if his claims are true? No, because he rose again the third day. Verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Moses is telling the new generation the word is right on your lips. You have it memorized. Do it. Obey. Interesting word for word. It's not the Greek word logos, which normally is used of ideas, to capture ideas. It's the word rima, which is the words themselves, the grammar, the structure of the sentence. The vocabulary, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, we just saw works cannot save, verses 4 and 5 told, tell us that. The purpose of the law was to convince man that he's lost and he cannot live up to God's standards. 
Faith cannot disappoint. And Deuteronomy 30 is a testimony that if we obey the gospel of Christ, faith will not disappoint and the message will save. So we come to probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible besides John 3.16. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the word confess means to agree with God. The word Lord Jesus means believe that he is God in the flesh. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be rescued. You know, that idea rescued has, a, has an idea that, that somehow we need rescuing. <laughs> that somehow we are, we are in big trouble here. Remember the tsunami that hit Thailand? 100,000 people lost their lives in that tsunami. And there was a guy floating on a tree seven miles or eight miles out in the ocean. And he had been out there eight days floating uh, on this tree. And he had been living off debris floating in the ocean and I, I want to just ask you, do you think that guy realized he was in a predicament as the sharks are, you know, swimming around, just like Louis, Louis Zamperini wrote in his book, the sharks swam around them for 47 days? Do you think that when that, that ship, that freighter came by and saw that guy standing on that tree and he's waving at him like this with not a stitch of clothing on, do you think that when that ship stopped, he realized this is my salvation? This is my physical deliverer right here and now? I, think, I don't think he had to stop and think about that. I think he realized this is my deliverer. And folks, when you realize your lost condition and you understand that Christ was given that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is your deliverer. If there was any other way that you could be saved, if you could keep the Ten Commandments, you could do the Golden Rule, all the different things that people believe that are going to save them and get them to heaven. You know, if I was really ornery and somebody said they're going to keep the Ten Commandments to get to heaven, their stair steps to heaven, I could say, can you quote them? I mean, if this is your lifeline, and of course Jesus reiterated nine of the Ten Commandments in the New Testament, put them in the heart realm and basically said, We're all, you're all guilty of breaking the law. If you broke the law at one point, you're guilty of the whole law. Nobody's going to get to heaven by doing good. We're going to get to heaven by realizing we're not good and that we need a rescuer, we need a deliverer, we need a savior. The gospel goes on to, 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 to tell us in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that. That's a quote out of Joel 2. That was true in Joel's day in the Old Testament. It was true in Paul's day in the book of Romans. And it's true of the day of the Lord, which Joel 2 is talking about, which is yet future. It has always been true. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord is going to be saved. I, I, I love that verse. I will often ask somebody, are you a whoever? Are you a whoever? And if they've trusted Christ and they've just called on the name of the Lord, we get off our knees. I will often quote this verse and say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What did you just do? I just called on the name of the Lord. What does that mean? And to hear it from their lips, I'm saved. Louis Zamperini had no idea what those words would mean in his life or in his eternal life. The third thing Paul said is not only do we need to have a deep compassion for the lost and a sufficient understanding of the gospel, we need to have a holy determination to obey the mission. We need to have a holy determination to obey the mission. Notice verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That is not a reverend, folks. That's you. If you know Christ as Savior and you open your mouth, you're a preacher. You're letting the rima, the words, come out of your mouth. The very words of God, if you're quoting Scripture, are coming out of your mouth. According to verse 17, by the way, those same words, then, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rima of God. The very words of God that come out of your mouth can create faith in the heart of the one that God is working in their lives and opening their heart by the words you speak, the words of God. It's incredible. Imagine you are the witness that witnesses to Louis Zamperini. You, you, you know everything that's going to happen in Louis Zamperini's future. Would you say something? Oh, I think all of us would say, let me tell you about the gospel. You know, the people of the mission, it says in verse uh, 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Would you do something for me right here and now? Would you look over your Bible and look at your feet right now? Just look at your feet. Everybody's looking at their feet. You know what? That, those feet you just looked at, that's the feet in verse 15. You are the feet of the gospel. I know they're not pretty. That's why there's shoes on them. But folks, those are the feet that take you places that God has planted you in a place, has exposed you to people that he's been working in and wants you to speak the words when he opens those doors. The people of the mission are us. It's incredible that the Great Commission is given in every gospel. Make disciples of all nations. Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Acts 1, 8, you shall be witnesses and then Throughout the book of Acts, you have the witnesses telling about the message of the gospel. I like to just point out to you, the Greek word for preach here is euangelizo. I only say that because I want you to see the root word in the word. It's angel. The you part is the good part. You are a preacher of good news. Imagine Pastor of the Pine getting up here and saying, I've got good news for you this morning. Not only did we pay off the mortgage and we're going to burn the mortgage today, but we had an anonymous donor come in and he wanted to say that anybody who came to church today was, has, has, is debt free. He's going to pay all your debts, all your school debts, your visa bills, your, your house bill, your, everything's paid for. Would that be good news? Oh, come on now. <laughs> You know that if that was said, there would be dancing in the hallways here, you know? I'm, come on. All right? Folks, the gospel is the greatest forgiveness of debt for eternity. Far more than any financial mortgage being burned. As great as that is, and, and for the testimony of this church, that's a great thing. And a, and a great launch into your future. But this church here is here not only to worship, but this church is here to evangelize. This church is here to scatter from this place of worship and evangelize every week. That's what God wants. How would you like to hear that good news today? Yeah, there's a lost world out there waiting to hear that good news. The gospel is good news to those who believe. I want to just give you some numbers here this morning. Do you realize that from Noah's flood to 1804, that's how long it took the world's population to get to a billion people? 
We use numbers today and we have no concept of them. Do you know that if you were to count to a million people a second at a time, it would take you 11 and a half days to do that? It would take you 32 years to count to a billion people one second at a time. You can do this on your calculator, you know, one second at a time. Just do them all. Do the math. 32 years. The Earth's population is so much greater than a billion. Another 119 years clicked off before 1923, the Earth's population reached 2 billion. 89 more years, 5 billion people clicked off. March 2012, we reached 7 billion. Today, it's 7.2 billion people on the planet. In the next 10 years, another billion people are going to show up. Boof! It took from Noah's flood to 1804 to get to that population. In your lifetime and mine, if God gives us the next 10 years, we will see another billion people on the planet. The population of the earth at the time of Christ when he gave the Great Commission was somewhere estimated between 200 and 300 million people. And I ask the question today, do you think if Christ were in this pulpit this morning, would he be given the Great Commission today? (laughs) absolutely he'd be calling forth workers from his church and saying who will go who will go across the street who will go across the aisle who will go across the ocean to bring my message we're 23 times greater than that of the earth of that time every eight seconds in our world Somebody, or in the United States, somebody dies in every 1.7 seconds. Somebody dies in the world. You talk about a world that is lost and dying. It's estimated that we have 100 billion stars when you look up in the night sky. If we put night vision goggles, you'd see a lot more. 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy And they estimate that there's a hundred billion more galaxies with hundreds of billions of more stars in each one. That's what makes this verse incredible. He counts the number of the stars. Not only can God count those stars, he has them named. That's why Psalm 139 says that the Lord's knowledge is infinite, his knowledge is wonderful. And as a finite human being, David said, I cannot attain that knowledge God knows the number of the stars. He calls them by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in in his power. His understanding is infinite. That stranger on the other side of the world is infinitely known by our God. Those people that we, we, we won't never, we'll never meet them. Is infinitely known. Not only does he know their name, he knows everything about them. Isn't that incredible? And the great shepherd of the sheep, as we'll see tonight in Luke 15, the great shepherd of the sheep is looking and working. And when someone says to you, oh, I've known God all my life. Well, you were born a lost sinner, according to the Bible. You weren't born a Christian, but you need to be born again to become a Christian. But I will agree with this, that God has been active in your whole life to bring you to the point of understanding the gospel. Remember this song that we used to sing in Sunday school, Untold Millions Are Still Untold? Untold millions are still outside the fold. Who will tell them of Jesus' love and of the heavenly mansions awaiting above? Jesus died on Calvary to save each one from sin. Now he calls to you and to me to go and to bring them in. You know, the only thing wrong with that song is it's out of date. It's untold billions, folks. I can't reach billion. You can't either. I can't reach a million, probably. Dwight L. Moody, it says of D.L. Moody, that he probably reached a million souls in his lifetime. Only eternity will tell. But folks, we are told that 95% of Christians will never have the privilege of leading another soul to Christ. There's something terribly contradictory about that. You're a gospel bomb, if you know Christ as Savior, you're a gospel bomb waiting to go off 
and bring the good news to people's lives. They may not see it as good news. They may, res they may resist you. We may get to the point in our country where we're persecuted, but you know what? It's still good news to those who put their trust in Christ and whose life has changed here and forever. Once again, we want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.